I wrote my tweet thinking, well, it'll just disappear right. and no one will ever see it. Like almost everything I do. <laughs> but you never know. Every now and then stuff picks up for whatever reason. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's Twitter and mm -hmm. it's annoying. You leave it and like when they realize you're not going to engage or fight back, it just, they, they need that in order to keep the rage Constant, machine yeah. going, you know? Um, and it's nothing compared to the one time that I said I didn't like a Kevin Smith movie. That was definitely oh, the worst. No. Wait, wait, yeah, which one? Uh, God, his most recent one. Um, I can't remember, like, Jay and Bob's, like, reboot or something oh, like that. people got upset yeah. over that? I thought you were going to well, say he, Clerks, and I was going to disconnect. No, no, no. I love Clerks, but I like all his films. And that was basically yeah. it. I was like, oh, I really, really liked Kevin Smith's films, but this most recent one, I just didn't enjoy it. And somebody... Yeah. Um, snitch tag kevin smith in on that tweet and then he sent his million plus followers after me oh um, kevin yeah. kevin so I'm like dude you're an asshole I, it sucks i like your films i always thought you were kind of an okay dude but i'm like no now i realize you're an asshole yeah. knowing him he was probably smoking weed at the time or cbd dude, or whatever just, he's doing I don't know. now yeah because someone said that it was like didn't you see jay and science strikes back i'm like yeah he's like dude he made an entire movie about getting pissed at people for comments <laughs> on the internet. I mean, what did you expect? And I'm like, yeah, I guess I didn't yeah. really put those two, two together. I'm like, you're right. Okay. Anyways, I did not bring you on here just for uh, Twitter drama uh, yeah. or Kevin Smith drama, as much as I might like that. Uh, I, I did want to talk to you about the great country of Nippon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh my God. Yes. So, yes. Uh, why don't we start at the very start? Uh, how did you get into just japanese culture and i guess the specific niche of uh japanese culture that you're into yeah i mean it's it's an interesting question so i mean it's interesting in the fact that i have like i have exact answers to this um but i mean like i grew up in the 70s and in the 70s um you know it's like one of the funniest things that people think about anime and um especially japanese content is there's a somehow idea that it that it emerged in the 90s with you know tsunami and sailor moon and dragon ball and stuff which is actually not true. I mean, it really emerged in the 70s. I mean, I grew up watching Bazinger. I grew up watching, uh, you know, Speed Racer, um, Star Blazers, Battle of the Planets, you know, like all of that stuff. I was pretty immersed in it from a pretty young age. You know, I have, um, I still have my uh, Shogun Warrior toy over there from when I was a kid. You know, I mean, like that stuff was just what I grew up on. I loved it. Um, but I had no idea that it was from Japan. That was not mm. something, you know, because it was, it was just presented. I mean, I knew it was different from other cartoons, um, but I was, you know, obviously I was young, but um, I didn't necessarily like, there was no connections like, you know, this is from Japan or something, but I, I did um, grow up loving it. And uh, then like one time, um, and this would have been 19, I think it was 1980, uh, I want to say. So anyways, around 1980, um, the Robin William movie Popeye came out. And <laughs> For whatever reason, I don't know who made this decision, but they showed Popeye as a double feature with Galaxy Express 999. Um, oh, wow. And they were in the movie theater together. And it was the Roger Corman version of Galaxy Express. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they were packaged together, but they were. And so as a family, we went to see them, right? And so I went into that theater um, and I, you know, I saw, and like Galaxy Express, it was just like this, this like, Oh, I don't know, like this awe moment for me. I just, and I, it, it connected all of these dots till up until then I hadn't necessarily known about it. I'm like, oh my God, this is Star Blazers. You know, this is like mm -hmm. all of this stuff is connected somehow. And I just like that movie just affected me so much. And like, I came out of the movie and like my whole family was like, oh, Popeye was great. And I'm like, but, but, but did you feel <laughs> what just happened there? Yeah. You know, with Galaxy Express and like with Maytel and like seeing Captain Harlock and like, all of this stuff, I just, I would just thought it was the most amazing thing. And, um, and so I started, you know, watching all those same old cartoons with just like a really new eye, because now I knew, I understood like what made them different, you know? Mm. And then later, like almost the same year, I forget exactly when it was, it was somewhere around then, and we had a local art theater and my mother took me to a showing of Seven Samurai which I still think uh, is weird, but that's the kind of person my mother was, where she's like, <laughs> I'll take an eight-year-old boy to like a three-hour subtitled black and white yeah. film. Um, and I saw it, and it was really the first time that I'd spent any time immersed in a foreign language, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I thought it was so interesting because you could hear these things, and obviously there were words, and obviously the people talking um, were making words, but to me, I just didn't, you know, it was, it was so fascinating to me. Like, I really wanted to know what it was like inside their heads. Like, did that stuff process as information or how did it think? But, um, and I just came 
completely fascinated with it. So those like two things were really the trigger. And it's so funny to see me in pictures at the time because I was just like, I was, you know, like we've got all these school pictures and we like, you know, pictures of me, just all my friends. And I'm inevitably wearing some ridiculous <laughs> Japanese t-shirt that says like me on it or something like that. You know, I don't oh, even know where God. I got them, but I was yeah. wearing them all the time. And, and it was just, it's just something that I've always been interested in. And it was so hard to get content back then too. Like there was almost nothing, you know, you could go to like mm. some hobby shops and maybe pick up some, some toys or something if you were lucky or, you know, you found what you could find. And then in, uh, in junior high, um, I had offering for a first Japanese class and I was really excited about that. So I signed up for it and um, I was only one of two students who signed up for it because like That's literally ideal. nobody, yeah, literally no, no, it wasn't ideal. The class got canceled um, oh, because there wasn't enough, but like literally no one cared about Japan back then. Like it was mm. just off everyone's radar. The languages that people were cared about, it was like you took French, German or Spanish. Um, but, you know, other opportunities crept up. Like in high school, I took another Japanese class because that was there and that one actually stuck. So I did a little bit more. Um, and just, you know, I took some more in college and it was all, it was all very casual. Um, I tried to get good at Japanese, but I never really did. And my interests, you know, <laughs> like stayed the same through most of my life. Uh, just like everyone else, you know. Loved the comics, watched the cartoons, you know, yeah. loved it all. Had a lot of wrong ideas that I thought were right because I didn't know any better. Oh, um, it's like you're talking about some people specifically online. <laughs> I mean, no, but I think everyone goes through that phase, right? You know, um, oh, like I was talking to some, like with some of my other translators friends the other day. And it's like, you know, like I think everyone starts that way, right? You start mm -hmm. with like a little phrase. You learn your first phrases of Japanese and all of a sudden like you think you know something, you know, and like, oh, you watch this movie and you think some, you know something. Yeah. And it's a process of like gaining knowledge and then you you almost move up to another plateau where you understand how little you actually know, right? Um, you're like, wow, I know so yeah. much. And then you move up, you're like, wow, I know nothing, you know. Um, there's still so much more and it's so much more vast and complex than I ever thought. Mm -hmm. But uh, that said, fast forward, I don't know, multiple years and I'm sitting in a cubicle in Amazon where I was a project manager and I was yeah. 30 years old and I was just like, um, you know, kind of like, wow, is this it? Is this all my life? Is this all <laughs> I get? I'm 30 and all I get to do is sit in a cubicle and be a project manager and get paid well, but do all this crap that right, I really right. don't particularly care about. So um, in uh, one of my smartest moves ever made or dumbest moves ever made, depending on who um, you ask, I threw it all away. <laughs> to uh, jump on an airplane to Japan, a country that I'd never been to before, but it only like briefly dabbled in the language and just, you know, like the entertainment popular mm -hmm. culture. And I joined the JET program. So I moved to Japan uh, thinking that I would just stay there for a year. Um, and then I ended up coming back like eight years later. So, wow. yeah. And that actually was going to be my next question because I did know that you attended the JET program say enough how much it changed my life completely you know i would have nothing mm -hmm. that i have now if it wasn't for the jet program um but the jet program also for all it is it's nothing more than a door and an opportunity and it does nothing for you like i know so right. many people went on the jet program and came home they stayed there for a year and it was fun and they came home and that's it you know they were done um other people like me it completely and utterly fundamentally <laughs> altered their lives um and took them to a whole different place so yeah. yeah. So let's talk about Japan, your experience mm -hmm. in Japan, uh, the JET program specifically. Uh, this will lead into other questions. Uh, I want to know if you had specific places in Osaka, but more specifically, I want to know if you have uh, a list of haunted places to visit. <laughs> uh, there's haunted places everywhere. And most of the best ones are going to be your something your neighbor tells you about you know that's the funnest to me they're like rather than the famous ones you know like you can go to himeji castle you can go to a lot yeah. of famous haunted places but the ones i always loved more were just like you know you're at a bar with a local person and they're like oh you know that house over there on the corner or something like that um and that's yeah so i mean i have all these favorite places but everything i love about osaka is small it's okay. not to be the big stuff, you know, and that's kind of the, the interesting thing. So like when you move to Japan, um, there's different phases you go through, right? Mm. Um, and the longer you are, like some people don't 
go long enough. And so they only go through the one phase, right? You know, the one phase is everything's amazing. And oh my God, it's all so cool, right? right? It's also different. Oh, wow. Wow. Look at all this stuff. And you're just like, wow, you go crazy. And then the longer you're there, um, the more you're like, oh, wow, everything's so normal. Um, yeah. This is actually not really that amazing. I mean, it's great, but it's not like you're at Disneyland anymore because you start to realize that that's like the superficial aspect of it. You know, all you're doing is seeing all the stuff that's different and it's all really amazing and cool. But then, like, especially when you gain language skills and you're able to sort of like leave that English language speaking bubble and move more into like just like the daily life of people, you get to sort of open up like, you know, the heart of the, of the country and people and realize mm -hmm. that it's actually not very different. You know, like when you're just sitting there hanging out, you know, like at work or something and having a conversation with someone, um, they're just human beings and that the human beings themselves are actually not different and that most of the differences are, you know, large. I mean, there are absolutely differences, of course, you know, there's cultural yeah. differences differences. Um, but the deeper you get into the culture, the less important those differences are. Um, and the more, I guess, important similarities are, you know, um, mm -hmm. and you see that, okay, so this is kind of like superficial. And this is actually like a fairly fundamental difference. And, and you change yourself, obviously. I mean, that's right. That's it would be of, hard not to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, so you become this sort of hybrid creature yourself. Like I always say that I'm not really and a lot of my American friends will say this to me. It's like, Zach, you're not American. I'm like, well, no, I'm not. I've lived overseas in too many countries. I'm, you know, if I didn't allow those experiences to penetrate me and change me, then what's the point of having them? You're some sort of uh, conglomerate Tetsuo the Iron Man sort of thing. Well, hopefully not that freaky. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that doesn't lead into my next question at all. But oh no, sorry. Uh, I, yeah, sorry. That's one of the other problems with my interview. I'm a very chatty person, so I oh, will it's just fine. fly all over the place. It, but, it's um, great. On the topic before of uh, yeah. of, I want to get back to um, yeah, yeah. haunted places. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, you wrote a book on uh, Ude. And, I did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was actually um, so. I did my master's degree in Japan. So that was basically mm -hmm. my master's thesis rewritten as a book um, oh, because <laughs> master's Efficient. thesis, are, yes, well, they are. I mean, master's thesis are fundamentally boring, right? Um, yeah. And when you, so in order to, when you make one, you're like, oh, I wrote this stuff. Like, what do I do with this? You know, um, but like Ghosts in Japan was so fascinating to me because that was one of the parts where when I got there, um, I found that, I mean, for one thing, my birthday is in August, on August 15th, which is mm. Omon, the Festival of the Dead in Japan. Okay. And so um, when I first got there, it was hot, it was summer, and Obon was going on. And, you know, um, and I just didn't understand any of it. It was all so amazing. You know, there's just like, like lanterns everywhere and people carrying, you know, like, I don't know, like people carrying incense. And it's, it's pretty awesome. I mean, it's this huge festival. The Obon, the Festival of the Dead, is one of the key festivals of Japan. Um, and I would ask a lot of my Japanese friends and contacts and coworkers about like, you know, what does this mean? Because I just wanted to know, you know, as a, as a fairly curious person, I wanted to know like a sort of deeper meaning behind a lot of this. And I found that a lot of my, you know, people I knew, like coworkers and stuff, like they didn't really know. Um, mm -hmm. And they would be like, well, this is what we do. And I'm like, why? What's the origin of that? And it makes perfect sense because it's the exact same thing with your own culture. Like if you ask, you know, how many Americans would know, like, why do you carve jack-o'-lanterns? Why do you put up a yeah, Christmas yeah. tree? You know, um, what is the origin and history of this? We know what we do. You know, we know our, like, sort of like with these experiences we have. Uh, but oftentimes, because we grew up with them, we don't ever seek to question beyond the layer of this is what we do. You know, we put up stockings. And maybe you know a little story about it, but you don't know very deep history. You know, like, right. like oh, you know, we put up tree lights and we've always done this. And like, why do we take thanks turkey on Thanksgiving? You're like, um, just what it's been. It's, it's, it's what we do. We've always done it. Um, but what I find fascinating, especially when folklore study is that looking into it, often you can trace back, you can find the why. And that's always really interesting to me. So I tried doing that with ghosts um, of just like looking through and finding, you know, a lot of these answers. And that itself, the whole process was amazing because it opened up this whole new part of Japan um, where a lot of things clicked and a lot of things made sense. And um, I wasn't certainly the first person to write about Japan and have that same realization. Like I, in my book, I talk about Lafcardio Hearn and he wrote his book. Actually, um, actually that yeah. is going to be brought up. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, so uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I, like I in had his it book, on standby. had it waiting. So in Lafcardio Hearn's book, um, Japan and Attempt at Interpretation, which was his way to really like try to explain the whys and wheres mm -hmm. of the culture, he came up with this idea that he called the rule of the dead, where the dead are actually have um, sort of like power over the living and that the uh, living's job is to sort of, you know, honor and preserve the dead and that is this whole power exchange between um the living and the dead that still goes on to this day and when i mm -hmm. sort of you know so he had that sort of same realization i did like if you learn about the ghosts of japan a lot of things make sense that didn't because the answer is because ghosts right. um, you know <laughs> and yeah so so it was fascinating and i loved it but i mean but ghosts also you know i mean like in japan ghosts are not like a lot of people sole experience with Japanese ghosts is through horror movies. And that's one of the yes, things I try to talk about in my one book. One of my big influences. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that, a, you know, a horror movie is a horror movie, but that's not the same thing as an interaction with a ghost necessarily, at least not yeah. from the Japanese uh, perspective. Kaidan. Yeah. Well, and ghosts are actually, I mean, like, because that is a religion in Japan. If you think it about that way, think of it like, you know, people like say ancestor worship. What is ancestor worship? Mm -hmm. It's ghost worship. You know, that's what ancestor worship is, is worship of the dead. So it's a very complicated uh, process, which was good because I got to write a whole book about sure. it. So you're uh, approaching this, I guess, more as a, more from a historical perspective. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask though was, uh, in terms of yurei and, and ghosts and hauntings, are mm -hmm. you approaching this as a skeptic, as a, I fully believe that these are, that there is something supernatural here, or I'm open to the idea of them proving me that there is so, something. I, ap I approach it as I, I often will say, it's like, I approach it as an agnostic point of view. You know, yeah. I, mean, I think that it's highly, presumptuous of human beings to think that they can know everything about the universe. Um, and I think it's highly uh, arrogant to think that we can explain everything, you know, that we know, you know, like what we know now may not necessarily be the truth. I mean, it it's always brings me back. And I mean, a lot of people use this example, but if you look at um, Richard, uh, Richard, Hawk not Richard Hawkins, yeah, The Brief History of Time, um, okay. his book on physics that he wrote. Um, you know, he leads, he opens the book talking about that. He's like, this is what we know now. Um, but just, you know, remember that what they knew, like, you know, a couple hundred years ago, you know, because he tells the story about Earth being on turtles and turtles all the way down and that sort Turtles of thing. all the way down, yeah. Yeah, is that that was what they knew then and this is what we know now. And hopefully, should this same book be written a thousand years from now, everything that I tell you is true will be proven wrong because they will know more than we do, you know? Right. So I kind of approach it from that perspective of just like, uh, you know, this is, these are the stories. These are the stories of the Yude. Um, I'm not going to judge them as true or false. You know, I, I'll tell you the history of something. You know, I mean, that, that gets into a lot of different uh, deep questions of does something being factually incorrect mean that it is no longer true? Right. Um, and almost every country um, has their venerated forgeries. Uh, the United States has the Liberty Bell. We love the Liberty Bell. It's mm. fake. It is not at all, you know, I mean, that's been proven scientifically, um, you know, that it is not the bell that everyone calls the Liberty Bell, but we don't care. Um, if you go right. to Scotland, they have the sword of William Wallace. It's fake, um, sci you know, proven by metallurgy studies, but that does not make it any less powerful. You know, the fact that something is not factually accurate, and that's the way that folklore and storytelling should work. It's not about, is it factually accurate? Is it, you know, there's a truth to stories that to me goes beyond facts. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting way of looking at it. I, uh, this is going to be a weird aside, but uh, I yeah, know sure. you're into comic books, uh, mm -hmm. at least to some degree. Um, oh, to a, to a degree more than any living human being should be, honestly, yeah. Right. I live and in I, comic books. What I'm about to reference won't be complete mm -hmm. gibberish, but I think back to this uh, anecdote I heard about Grant Morrison, uh, mm -hmm. and he met a superman cosplayer at a con like right before writing all-star superman and mm -hmm. they sat down and he talked to him as if he was superman and then he came mm -hmm. out of that experience saying well i talked to superman i know how to write this book like yeah, to oh, him, yeah. it's like it doesn't matter that that wasn't superman it was like no this is uh, this is him sure right i'm going yeah like, absolutely and whether that him is an avatar at the time or a representation or whatever it is, that's mm. not really the point. The point is, is he got to have that, that emotional context and that feeling, you know, yeah. which is, a, you know, that's the truth versus the, yeah. So yeah, that's a very interesting way of looking at it. One last question about uh, ghosts. I haven't read your Yurei book yet, 
it's but fine. um it's it's now on my amazon wish list mm -hmm. while i was perusing i also saw that you have another book on ghost cats uh, i do yeah if i were to run across a ghost cat what are the identifying features that i <laughs> like if i just saw a cat in japan uh -huh. what are the identifying features that i would need to look for for to tell if it's a ghost cat Oh my God. See, that's a complicated question too. There's like, there's like eight different breeds. Oh, and no. so each of them has a distinct characteristic. <laughs> yeah. So um, I would say that if the first, so the first thing about cats, like Kaibyo is what they're called, which is the supernatural mm. cats. Uh, I have to admit, I always get a little annoyed at the term ghost cat because they're not ghosts, which would be something that's oh, dead. Okay. So they're not dead, right? They are a transformed animal because it's part of Japanese folklore is that if something that lives too long, can gain supernatural power, right? And yeah. so it has to live too long. So like a cat that's like 12 or 15 years, that's pretty old, but a 20 year old cat, okay, that's freaky, right? That at that point, that's weird. They, yeah, they assume supernatural abilities and depending on, and this is a lot true of Yure as well, uh, which is in the book, but depending on what you are inside, you manifest that assumption of supernatural powers differently. Um, mm -hmm. So like, a t like some cats become very monstrous and those are, um, they grow two tails and that's what's called the nekomata and they're just like monsters oh. um and some cats are very sly and clever and so they become like fucking echo and it really you know some cats just like to sit around and by the fire and be warm and there's another supernatural cat for that so it oh, really yeah. i got one of those their, yeah right on their innate <laughs> personality and some cats are just evil they become these things called kasha which are corpse eaters and uh yeah oh geez yeah more like demons than anything else yeah so okay. just watch out for any cat that's too old. Okay, old cats or cats with two tails. Yes, can, uh, yes. Definitely okay. keep an eye out for. Stay away from those. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I forgot that I wanted to mention that when I wrote out that last question, I said, how do you identify ghost cats? What are the telltale signs? Oh, yes. that, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyways, very, very clever. Aside, well, you see, it's a it's a language pun, and I know that it you is. dabble in translation, which is what. Uh, oh, is that is that our segue? Oh, right, awesome. Uh, so you you do translation work, uh, and I, do, yeah. I I have a chicken or egg uh, question for you. Did you get into the uh, GGG no Kitaro stuff because you were into yokai, or did that get you into yokai? Uh, gosh, that's a good question. So, um, and my answer is probably not going to be as compact as you, as you wanted. <laughs> so, um, cause none of this is, um, so one of the things, and this is, so this is another experience that a lot of people have, right? If you're one of the people like you or like me, mm -hmm. where you're a Japan guy, right? You watch the anime, you read the manga, you're sitting here in America or whatever country you are. And you're like, look, I know my Japan stuff, right? I know my sushi. Yeah. I can tell you about, I can tell you all this stuff. I've learned a bunch of these facts, right? Boom, 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 chaka, chaka, chaka. Then you get on the plane, you get to Japan and you step off the plane and you're looking around and you're like, I know literally nothing. <laughs> like almost every single thing I thought I knew is completely wrong. I didn't know a damn thing. And I was essentially a fool who thought he was, you know, knew all this stuff. And one of those things to me was Mizuki Shigeru. I got to mm -hmm. Japan, he was everywhere. I mean, oh, yeah. Kitaro stuff was absolutely everywhere. And I had never heard of him. And it was so weird of me to realize that I, what I got there, because that's one of the things that I, I realized and a lot of people, um, and actually as a jet advisor, I can tell you that um, the people that have the hardest time in Japan, um, because one of my jobs was to greet new jets and help get them orientated. And the people that have the hardest time are the ones who are the really hardcore Japan people, the ones that oh, no, yeah. think they know so much. Because once they get there and they realize that they're so, you know, it's like there's this dissonance that happens. And there's actually, um, there's a phrase for it in Japanese that's also used, it's called Paris of my dreams. And it oh, is used yeah. for, you know, for Japanese people who build up this like huge idea of Paris being this, you know, beautiful, wonderful place. And then they go to Paris and it's just like any other city anywhere. And yeah. they have like this shock, you know, it shatters. All. And so you would have that with people who come there and they're like, ah, oh, you know, you'd see them get off the plane. And you're just like, okay, this one's gonna, because they have a hard time because it's such a dissonant experience. Whereas people who go knowing nothing, um, they don't have that. They don't have all these preconceptions, right? They don't have this image built up in their head that needs to be shattered before they can um, 
experience the real Japan per se. Right. Um, and that was one of those things for me is getting over there and realizing it's like, wow, like, you know, Mizuki Shigeru, you know, his stuff was just everywhere. It was everywhere. I um, mean, you know, granted, Japan was going through another Kitaro boom at the time, which oh, they yeah, did from yeah. time, you know, from time to time. And I was just like, who is this? You know, and, you know, my Japanese friends would be like, oh, well, you like manga? I'm like, yeah, I love manga. And they're like, well, of course, you know, Mizuki Shigeru, then one of the most famous <laughs> manga artists to have ever lived. How can you, you know, it's like literally like, like, like imagine someone coming over, I don't know, from any country they get to America and they're like, yeah, you know, I really love American animation. You know, like, I really love it. I'm, I've been studying American animation for all my life. I'm a huge American animation fan. You're like, what's your favorite Disney film? They're like, never heard of him. Disney? Who's Disney? <laughs> I mean, it was that much of a thing right. for me to realize that that my knowledge was so was so out of step with, with Japan, you know, and that's true because the stuff that sells in America, the stuff that's popular here is very different from the stuff that's popular in Japan. And so like the anime that is huge over here is completely unheard of over there. Nobody even knows who it is. It's obscure beyond measure, you know? Um, but Mizuki was just like, like I saw his stuff and I just thought it was so interesting. Um, and I started to buy it and read it. And the more I learned about Mizuki Shigeru, the more I was like, like, cause he is like a fundamental figure of Japanese culture. Like he mm -hmm. is the, he is one of the, like the two or three pillars that this is all built on, you know, Mizugi and Tezuka, you know, I mean, like, they're just like, they are, they built the whole house that we all play in. Um, and he was like, he himself was just a fascinating human being. I mean, in Japan also, I mean, Mizugi is considered to be so much more than Kitaro. I mean, like they had TV shows that were just dedicated to the, like the love story of him and how he, how he met his wife. I mean, he was a, a national hero um, of the status that we almost don't have in the United States. So we certainly don't honor um, comic book creators that same yeah. way. I mean, the closest I could think would be Stan Lee, but even then he's far more revered than Stan yeah. Lee ever would be. Um, he also, Stan Lee also probably has more, uh, I don't know, detractors, <laughs> but yeah. That's oh yeah. Yeah. No, that's true too. Like, like Mizuki didn't have it. Everyone loved Mizuki. Um, yeah. And so I just started reading his books and it was so fascinating. And like, and that was, you know, like I'd always been interested in yokai and, uh, you know, just like monsters also. Like when I lived in Scotland, I read a lot about Scottish folklore. So folklore has always been something I really loved. Mm -hmm. And that was just like, it was such an interesting, you know, part of it all. And Mizuki was responsible for so much of that. So yeah. the interests really ran parallel, you know, because the more I learned about Mizuki, the more I learned about yokai and the two together just like blossomed into this this deep love. And that was also, you know, that was how I became a translator because, you know, I like, I never wanted to be a manga translator. It was never like, oh, I would <laughs> like to be a manga translator. What I wanted was to translate Mizuki. I found that, um, mm. that it was just like, it was such an amazing, he was so amazing. And I just fell in love with him so much and all of his work and who he was. And I thought it was just so strange that none of his work was in the West, you know, that this vital yeah. key important figure was entirely um, unrepresented in the West. And so like, I actually, uh, and I've told this story a bunch and it's absolutely true, but I once got drunk at uh, one of my friend's bars in Osaka and I climbed up on the table and I raised my fist and I shouted out, I shall be the one to bring Mizuki Shigeru to the West. And I like, <laughs> you know, decided to make it like my holy mission. Um, and so that's really like a lot of it, you know, like as a translator, it started out not wanting to be a manga translator, but really wanted to be dedicated to be to Mizuki Shigeru, you know, mm -hmm. to bringing him over and to just like exposing people to this really, really amazing human being. And what I think is one of the few geniuses, like true geniuses to ever have worked in the um, media of comics. Along that line, uh, I have noticed that, mm -hmm. well, we have three examples right here yeah. of you translating more niche, older titles. Uh, as a translator, I guess, like, do you get to pick? Can you just pick and choose? Like, what? Oh, God, no. Absolutely no. not. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Um, and yeah, I mean, like, obviously, like, and that's the other thing, like, and even still to this day, like, I'm never really interested. Like, there's different types of translators. And I am obviously very different from a lot of what I would consider to be like bread and butter translators, right? You know, yeah. like a lot of them, a lot of people that I know, they're good friends of mine. And they basically just, they are, they work with whatever work comes down the pike. You know, if it's something they like, something they don't like, um, they take it and they, and they do it, you know, and sometimes it's awesome. And sometimes it's a series they really love. Um, and sometimes it's not, you know, sometimes yeah. they just 
they just want a paycheck. And so they're translating stuff, you know. Um, I'm a little, I'm just much more different in that I'm, I curate kind of what I translate a lot differently. Like um, Matsumoto Leiji, Leiji Matsumoto, he's, he was one of the core people of my childhood, you know, mm -hmm. Galaxy Express, you know, Star Blazers, like that was the stuff that I grew up with. And he also, once again, never represented in the West. Like none of his work was available here. There was, strangely enough, there was um, another comic that had done an unauthorized version of Harlock back in the 90s. Oh. Um, but but that was it. None of actually Matsumoto's work was here. Um, and so I really wanted to do that. And uh, I mean, you know, I was fortunate enough to get hired to do that by someone who knew how passionate I was. And so mm -hmm. when they got the license, they called me up. Um, and that's been the same way with, you know, with like Gona Guy stuff. Like, I just really like this old manga. Like, this is the stuff that I grew up with. And so it's the stuff that I get super passionate about, you know. Um, same with stuff like Satoshi Kon's work. Uh, yeah. I just... I really like working on stuff that I feel extremely passionate about. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to, to do that, you know, mm -hmm. um, as well as work on some fun new stuff, like stuff like, uh, like Go Tanabe. I'd never even heard of him before. I started working on his work for his HP Lovecraft. I was about to say that I had also never heard of him until. Yeah. Yes. I have seen those, uh, those HP Lovecraft adaptations. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, yeah, like I have my shelf that's just right over there of all my translations and like every single one of them is something that is, that I personally love, you know, that's like really personal to me. But I don't, you know, I don't get to pick the books and there's certainly several that I was like, oh, I wish I could have done that, you know, oh, oh. you know, um, you know, I wish I could have done that. But I mean, for the most part, yeah, and, and I have good relations with certain companies, you know, that I'll keep working on, um, like, mm. like Mizuki Shigeru's stuff. I can't imagine anyone else but me would ever translate it. Like Mizugi's family really likes me. Um, they actually just wrote me a lovely little note the other day Aww. thanking me for the work that I'd done um, in preserving Mizuki's legacy. And that was nice. And so I can't imagine anyone else. But also that, you know, that's a licensing thing because Drawn and Quarterly fortunately has the license for them. So, yeah. um, and they keep me as their translator. Uh, but a lot of other stuff, you're like, you know, you, you, don't, like, you don't get a pick. It's really done by editors that, that's the editor's job to pick the translator they think will suit the material best. Um, and yeah, hopefully I'll get to, you know, work on more cool stuff. That's uh, one of my, one of my questions mm -hmm. was, is there a holy grail? Yeah. So this is, this is a great question because it was actually, I had a huge um, crisis basically mm -hmm. not too long ago um, where there was a holy grail oh, and it was, okay. It was actually called my holy grail and me and my friends, especially one of my old friends, someone that I had known all like just almost all of my life and I've been friends with forever. We used to refer to it as the holy grail. You know, it was like I would get into <laughs> manga and he's like, what about the holy grail, Zach? And I'm like, I'm working on it, man. I'm working on it. And the holy grail was Space Battleship Yamato because oh, that was wow. that was the show yeah. I grew up on. Right. More than anything else, you know, Star Blazers, um, Space Battleship Yamato just really impacted who I was and I did it I translated Space Battleship Yamato and it was done and then I was just like well, what do I do now I and mean, what do you do once you've got your holy grail you know do I just because I didn't have anything else that I was really in love with like I had achieved right. every dream like if I had a list of like I used to have what I call my hope shelf and on that hope shelf I put every single book that it was my dream to translate and I translated every single one of them and then once I was done with it I had nothing and I was just like what do I do now do I just oh no you know, do I become one of those working line translators that just translates everything? And I, like, I tried doing that. And I, like, it's like, if I'm not really passionate about something, I don't love it as much. Um, but fortunately, I found new stuff to be passionate about. And that was really great, too. Like, mm -hmm. like Gotenabe, super passionate about his work. Um, I'm so excited. And Gotenabe, I've also developed a good relationship with, which has been great. Like, so I like it so much more when I feel like I can be, like, sort of, someone's voice in English, you know, like, like if I, like with Matsumoto Leiji or Mizuki Shigeru or now with Gotenabe, like, like I get to sort of like share that love and enthusiasm with people. Wow, that's, uh, yeah. that's great. So speaking of uh, manga translations, there's one specifically that I want mm -hmm. to talk about because uh, this is partially written by a director that I love. Uh, and oh yeah. Seraphim. Oh yeah, uh, Seraphim. Oh, however many of those wings. Um, yeah, this... that 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 number of wings, by the way, is the actual number in the Bible. So that yeah, that's all calculated. So that is the number of wings on angels in the Bible. 
Uh, of course, Mr. Oshii. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, Mamoru Oshii is one of my favorite directors. Thank you mm-hmm. so much for uh, working on this. Yeah. Uh, um, but how difficult was it? Like, oh, with was, two directors that are so cerebral yeah. and Oshii's in- dialogue already being so... Uh-huh. Yeah, it was insanely difficult. And, one of, uh, like, I really like Seraphim. It's one of my favorite things that I've worked on, and I think I was highly successful with it. So um, one of the things when you're translating is you have to find that person's voice. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's the hardest thing that you do with a, new, with a new person you've never worked on before. Like the first volume or the first pages, they always take a lot longer than the rest of it. Because yeah. you have to not only find their voice, but you have to sort of internalize it. Like you have to feel like, how does this person sound if they were speaking English? Like, what do they do? Um, and Oshii, for example, like he uses a lot of, really really complicated and obscure kanji like that was kind of his thing you know like you know the kind of stuff that like if i showed to my wife i'm like what is this mean she's like i don't know i've never (laughs) seen that before he likes to make you look stuff up you know is kind of how it is and so when i was doing that in the translation in english i'm like the way that you would replicate that feeling is to try and stick a bunch of big words in there right you know um, right. and like he likes a lot of metaphor and he likes a lot of you know especially like biblical metaphor and things like that it's all layered in really deep and so i try i try as much as possible to to replicate the feeling of what it's like to read this person in english and the same feeling it is to read them in japanese and um that was also really interesting because uh, as it says in the book, you know, like um, there's a little afterward that talks yeah. about it, is you can feel the struggle between Kone and Oishi as they push and pull against each other. And about midway through, Kone's voice starts to emerge. Mm. Um, and so then all of a sudden you have to switch voices, you have to switch tones, because you can see that he's now putting dialogue in there. It's much simpler. It's yeah. much more, um, you know, it's much more human than Oishi's dialogue, which is like his his is very sonorous, right? You know, he's, he is giving a lecture. He's a man at a pulpit um, delivering lectures. And that's how his voice is coming out. Whereas, you know, Satoshi Kon, he's like the guy sitting next to you at the lunch table and his lunch isn't actually that great, you know? And, you know, like, so you, <laughs> cause, cause Satoshi Kon just is, is a humanist, you know, right, um, right. And in, in a way. And it's like, it's like a battle between head and heart is how I always think of it, right? Oh, she's all, all head. Kon is all heart. And the two of them were sort of like, you know, in this battle with each other. And so, you know, but it, it was just, it was such a fact. And it was also, you know, because once again, same, two directors I absolutely love and adore. Mm-hmm. And so the chance to, to be there and try and experience that push and pull, you know, and try and to manifest that as best as possible, you know. So, and that's always my key with translations too. Like I, my, every time I do a translation, what I really want to give the reader is as much as possible the same experience that someone reading the book would have in Japanese, right? So like Matsumoto Leiji, for example, he is extremely melodramatic and he is vast and his um, world is huge and he's mythological. And somehow you have to portray that, but it's not cheesy mytho, like it's not cheesy. Right. It's melodrama that gives you goosebumps. It's like, oh, you know. Um, and so you have to be able to find that voice and figure out how do I, how do I convey the same sense of awe and the same sense mm-hmm. of, you know, that he's trying to do. But then Mizugi Shigeru, on the other hand, is is very earthy, right? Like Matsumoto Leiji's characters don't poop, but Mizugi oh, Shigeru yeah, characters definitely do. And you have to, you know, <laughs> if you really get to be able to sort of like internalize that voice, it's like now, if I'm doing Mizugi, I can jump back into his voice instantly. I don't have to reprocess that. And it goes, it goes really nice. Um, so speaking of authors and finding their voice, uh, I actually also wanted to talk about, where is he? Oh, uh, Go Nagai. Uh, oh, yeah. Specifically, because I'm going to be careful mm-hmm. how I phrase this. Yeah, I yeah, don't yeah. want to come across the wrong way. Yeah. But with an author like Go Nagai, he goes into extremes and mm-hmm. he has works that in America wouldn't hold up to, I don't know. Certain oh, no, totally, totally. People would freak. I mean, but- yeah. But the thing is, is once again, I mean, like, like I love Go Nagai. Like, yeah. I love all of his awfulness. Like, it's something that I love <laughs> completely. Um, like, I was doing Cutie Honey. Um, and actually, you know, that was kind of the funny thing. It's like, I actually like Cutie Honey much more than I like Devil Man. I already, really? always have. I like Devil Honey. Yeah, Devil Man. Devil but Honey. to me, Cutie... Sorry. I mean, I love Devil Man. It's great. But to me, Cutie Honey is just, like, my favorite. And I knew it wasn't... 
everyone's favorite, but to me it was. I just love right. it. I love Cutie Honey because it's so crazy and it's so wacky, right? Like Gona Guy is just, he just shoots from the id and that's all he knows how to do, right? Mm -hmm. And his stories rarely make logical sense. And there's like this great scene in Cutie Honey where like, um, you know, one page, you, you're just flipping a page and all of a sudden this giant elephant just bursts through a wall <laughs> with one of the villains riding on top of it. And like, you have to be okay with that with Gona Guy, right? You just have to roll with it. You have to go yeah. to crazy town with him. And, um, and you know, and like, I think like a lot of it's like, like in the 1980s, I was just like, I was a punk rocker. I mean, that is who I was. And to me, go, like, I talk about that when I sometimes uh, talk about translation lectures is that, you know, Gona Guy, he's punk rock, right? You just... You can't, you just got to go wherever that crazy train is taking you. You got to jump on and go. Um, and it's not my job to decide if that's going to be palatable for English speakers. Right. right. I don't, I don't care to be honest. Like if you're offended by a Gona guy comic, be offended. I mean, I mean, my job is, is to serve the guy. Right. And to right. try and get his vision in English as much as possible that I can. Um, for me, Gona guy is, just, you know, translating him is, it was so much fun because he's just like, you know, he just goes to places that the other artists I work on never, never would go, obviously, oh, yeah. you know, absolutely. And to me, that was just so much fun. I loved it. Um, and, you know, Devil Man was, you know, I mean, obviously Devil Man was like, it was a big challenge, you know, I mean, it was like, I mean, there was a lot of, you know, like, as always, it's the hard part of like, how do you, how do you yeah. do this? You know, how do you put this in English? Um, you know? How do you get that same feeling, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, so. especially with a, uh, I mean, with Devil Man specifically, mm -hmm. uh, I feel like so much of it is built off of a reaction, like, to the time period that it's in. Like, mm -hmm. like you said, it's that punk rock energy. And yeah. uh, I guess also, like you were talking about before, taking that out of the 70s and taking that work and then showing it to people now, it's like they're not going to be reading it in the same context and climate that no. you know some kid no. reading Devil Man would read it. No, totally. Mm -hmm. But um, but I mean, and me personally, and like, and obviously, I mean, that's one of the other things that a lot of people don't understand is that a lot of people will think that and I've noticed that a lot on Twitter, and it always surprises me <laughs> because I understand how little people understand how the sausage is made per se. Yeah. When these things that they seem to think that translators have a lot more power than they have. Um, editors have all the power. I mean, editors can just go in and change your stuff. You know what I mean? And that is, that is how it, it's, it's set up. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the good thing. I mean, editors have final say. And so like, I could put something in there that is just like filthy and I think it's perfectly fine. And then it's up to the editor to decide whether or not that, you know, that's not my call to make, you know, yeah. um, when it comes to, to translations and that's totally you know like i'm just working on tono monogatari right now which is the latest music you get a piece and i'm doing back and forth with the editor because i want to put something in and they want to change it and so like um and in a good editorial relationship that's how you work together uh mm -hmm. pushing back and forth so uh but yeah if it was up to me i would just say like i don't care if people <laughs> don't like it i mean go to guy didn't make stuff to not offend you he right, made stuff right. to offend you on purpose you know that is why he did it and so it should be offensive. Like it shouldn't be watered down at all. Like all of that madness should be in there. Some of these releases, you know, like it's a lot like, like I like Disney films and some of the older uh, Disney cartoons, they put a little, and same with Popeye, you know, they put a little yeah. disclaimer on it. They're like, hey, and personally, I like that much better than trying to adjust it for modern taste, which is something I'm, I'm pretty opposed to and wouldn't personally do. Yeah, I don't even know where I went for that. It's a good <laughs> Good question that I went into, you know, random town. Like, you know, no, no, that's, yeah. that's fine. Um, yeah. I don't know. Speaking of disclaimers, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think I've seen you explicitly say that this choice was not, was not your choice. It was an editor's choice uh, mm -hmm. of not putting a, um, a disclaimer in front of the added chapters to Devil Man. Oh, um, I mean, if that, no, that wasn't, even a, that wasn't even an editor's choice. That was oh, Go to Guy's choice. Go to Guy, like, we have no ability to, to say, what gets published or not you know I mean, we just I okay. mean, we can ask but ultimately and that's one of the things i love so i love the fact that mm -hmm. that gona guy gets to have the say even if it's not what we want because it's his work and he should be able to control it and i often use this example um, when it comes to 
you know, if we want to open up that particular can of worms, but I, I talk about that with scanlation, you know, it's like mm -hmm. many people would rather have had a different version of devil man. I would rather have had a different version of devil man. That is not, I didn't want, you know, the shin devil man added in there. Yeah. I want it. And that's the thing about going to guy is he has multiple, it's like he has multiple versions of devil man. And he's like, and the other person that I often compare going to guy to is George Lucas, because I think that they have that same desire to go back and fiddle with their old work. Right. Yeah. Um, and so like, say you license star Wars and you're like, Hey, what we really want is the original new hope, you know, like that one. Um, but he will only sell you the special edition, you know, he right. won't give you that one. Right. And sometimes that's a bummer, but it respects the artist's ability to say no. And I think that is key. I think that, that giving Gona guy the ability to say, no, this is the vision of the work that I find the best and the most pure, and this is what I wanted. And so this is what you get to do. Um, to me, that feels very good because we've respected Gona guy. We've allowed him to tell us what he would like, for his work. Um, and even though it's not necessarily what I would have preferred personally, that shouldn't be my choice. That should mm -hmm. be Gona Guy's choice, you know? And that matters to me so much. It matters to me so much that the artist gets to have a say in what happens to their work, you know? Um, and it was like that with Mizuki Shigeru when I was, you know, when I talked to him about, you know, it's like, these are the works of yours that we would like to translate, you know? And he's like, well, okay, but. I want you to do this one too, or I you right. know, like got to, you know, have a talk with him about what he wanted and how to preserve his legacy with devil man. Like if it was, you know, once again, I don't get to make choices and I work differently with every editor and every company is differently. Like, so with, with music stuff, I usually write like a little forward. I usually, you know, I write like a little extra or something in there. Um, and other companies don't want me to do that. And that's right. totally fine. And it's totally their choice, you know? Um, I get no say in those things whatsoever. So, okay. uh, but if it was me, I would have put like, like with Captain Harlock or any of those, like, like even with um, Space Battleship Yamato, like I wanted, I would have liked to have written um, something there saying, for example, um, one of the parts of Matsumoto Leiji's work is he doesn't finish anything ever. <laughs> he finishes yep. nothing. Just expect the story to stop midway. And that is a feature, not a bug of Matsumoto Leiji, <laughs> right? Every single story you ever read from him will never finish because he yep. does not finish things. So when you turn the last page and realize that it stopped mid sentence, you're just like, that's Matsumoto Leiji, you know? There so he goes. I, yeah. So I always, I mean, I always appreciate it when, um, when companies give me the opportunity to do that, you know, when I get to write something extra or something, um, Dark Horse is usually pretty good at it. Uh, you know, I've written a few different things for Dark Horse. Uh, Drawn and Quarterly, I do it almost every single time and that's mm. been really great. And if it was up to me, almost every manga I did would be accompanied by that. They would be like, all right, you know, here's Cutie Honey. Why does Cutie Honey matter? You know, like, yeah. who is she? Here's the historical perspective, you know, like. Fans like, yeah, like me really appreciate that stuff. Like that's, I don't, for older releases, like maybe mm. not so much newer stuff where yeah. the author's still living and, you know, if they want mm -hmm. to put their work in a cultural context, they can. Uh, but, you know, I, I really liked finding out little details and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, basically, Seraphim, to go back to that, it, it feels like a more complete book because there is mm -hmm. a, here's why this didn't end. Here's why totally. this yeah. doesn't have an and ending. <laughs> And that was me sort of insisting that be put in there. It's like, look, we can't give them a book without an ending, without yeah. an explanation about why there's no ending, you know? Um, and like an opus, I think is very different because opus, I oh, actually yeah. feel like it, I actually feel like opus has an ending, even it's though magical. it doesn't. Yeah. But even though it doesn't end per se, I think the fact that the very fact that opus is about an artist creating a world. And then when the death of the, when the artist dies, the world ends. And to me, mm -hmm. that part of it is so, you know, like so poignant. So like one of the last phrases are the last parts of Opus that I'll never forget because like, because I'm such an emotional guy. I was literally in tears when I was translating it. I'm glad that no one has to watch me because I get so emotional <laughs> about this stuff. And I'm just like, uh, you know, because Satoshi Kone wrote this last line where he's like, you know, hey, you know, we'll meet again someday, you know, oh. basically it's like, you know, I'll see you again. The story will continue. Yeah. And you're like, but it won't because you died. And that is so amazing because it shows that when an artist dies, all of the worlds they create and could have created die with them. You know, that's not just an end of some person's life. It's also the end of all these other lives that they made and mm -hmm. they're all gone now too. 
Opus's ending is almost too perfect to like right? fit in well, with it's... thematically with the entire work. It it is one of those when I said magical, I more meant that like it's amazing that it was intended to have an ending, but by not having an ending, it almost yeah, by not feels more ending. appropriate. Right? One of the other, you know, speaking of Satoshi Kone, one of the things that to this day, you know, and once again, this is one of those things where you you have to respect artists' ability to say no, is that Satoshi Kone and Otomo did a comic together called World Apartment Horror that I would absolutely love to translate. I mean, it's been on my dream list forever, but Otomo has said no. I mean, for whatever reason, you know, and that's a bummer and it sucks, but it matters that he gets to be able to do that. You know, people should be able to refuse because if they're not able to refuse, then why did you even ask? You know, just, to, and I, I just feel this very strongly about artists, you know, even though it's a yeah. bummer, I want them, I respect them as the originators of this material. Um, and I respect them as the people who should be able to to give that yes or no, you know, they are the only ones who can say that yes or no, you know, even though as a translator and as a reader, I'm just like, oh, well, that sucks. I'm like, yeah, it does sometimes. Um, but the fact that it's a bummer doesn't then give you the right to disrespect their wishes, to my mind, and just go take it anyways, you know, it's like, right. oh, you said no, uh -huh. you know, tough. I'm just going to take it. So, so uh, does that apply to fan translations? Uh, in in terms of, you know, sometimes there's a work that is fundamental to a genre, uh, mm -hmm. has cert has built the sort of building blocks of any combining robot thing, but mm -hmm. it's not available legally. And I might have Japanese copies of Get a Robo down below me somewhere. But yeah, no, <laughs> I mean, and and it's such it's such a it's such a complicated question. I mean. Mm -hmm. it, for me, it's pretty simple. I mean, for me, and this is, and I realize this is not the experience of everyone, and my experience would be very different, but my, my opinion on this changed drastically when I started speaking to Hmong artists on a personal level, on a human level, right? That affected me very deeply. And I also started talking to some of them and realizing how utterly sad it made them when people took their work, you know, and yeah. did fan translations. Um, and they were just like, I just wish someone would ask me, like, if you, it would, means so much to me if someone and you know would just like write me an email and say hey i know that you don't have a legal right to this or something but would you mind you know like just sort of like what do you think about this or just like like that somehow their voice was mattered to people rather than just the product because that's how it ends up feeling is they're like i as a human being don't matter all that matters is my product so you just take mm -hmm. that because that's all that matters to you right just the product i as a human being am completely irrelevant to you you didn't even care enough about me to ask if you could take it, you just took, you know? Um, and so I think that way it's like, like a lot of that stuff, like the, you know, people talk about this foundational stuff, like blah, 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 we have this reason to do it and that reason to do it. And a lot of them are valid reasons. And if yeah. I didn't have this sort of emotional and personal contact with some of these artists, and if I was able to be more separated from that, you know, if I was not thinking of them as human beings, it's just thinking of it from a sort of abstract perspective, my opinion would probably be very different, but it's not, you know, right. And there's stuff like, um, like, God, is that Ishinomori that just did that? Oh, uh, Ishinomori just having stuff, tr or just having, um, what is it, Godanger? Yeah, He's Godanger. And so that's another classic example of like, you know, and that's the other thing that I've learned is that there's never, the door is not always closed. People say, this is never getting translated. And then it does. And yeah. so never becomes sometime. So the never is not actually a thing. Um, Especially now when, yeah, like now more than ever, uh, I don't know. I, I think of stuff that I want translated or I want brought over. Mm -hmm. And most of the time it, it's like, oh yeah, that comes out next year. Oh yeah, yeah. that's that weird, obscure little uh, 60s, 70s manga. That's going to be over here like within mm -hmm. uh, a matter of months. And I'm like, oh. And okay. there's... You know, and there's stuff that like, um, you know, that I always say, I say, like, it's a long shot. Odds are that that right. will never be translated. That is, odds are. Um, and so my personal feeling on it is that, you know, I don't know. I also, you know, and this is just what it is, but I kind of feel like, like if they're dead, then go to town, you know, have a party <laughs> because then it doesn't really matter as much anymore, right. you know, um, uh, because there's no one there to be for personally disappointed or something like that. But at the same time, I work with Mizuki's family and I realize how important Mizuki's, you know, the legacy of Mizuki is to his daughters, you know, for example. And so there's still that personal connection. So even though Mizuki's dead, I don't think like, yeah, go to town, 
you know, I'll just translate right. everything I want. I don't have to ask them anymore, right? Oh, now it's, you know, all cards on the table. I, that's, that's wrong. So I don't know. That's the complex part of it. It's like, to me, it's just like, it's not anything to do with money. It's not anything to do with companies. It's not anything to do with official versus unofficial or blah, 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 or all that other, to me, just like chaff that people like to throw into the argument. Right. To me, what really matters in the argument is the artist as a human being and their ability to like go to a guy to say no, you know, yep. to say, no, you don't get that devil, man. You only get the special edition, you know? <laughs> and for us to say like, well, we're disappointed in that. And that's fine right. because he is the one that should make that decision, not me. And if I'm disappointed about it, well, that's also fine because sometimes we want stuff from people that they don't want to give and they should be able to say no, you know? I don't know if I'm going to speak for the entirety of a, uh of Western anime fans. But I do think that part of the problem is that uh, the the fan translation, fan scanlation, fan subs, mm -hmm. that's all been sort of baked into the community at this point. Like, oh, totally, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know that there's, a, I mean, I certainly have no solution. I mean, I, you know, like myself and uh, my good friend, Rachel Thorne, we've been um, the enemy of many people's ire on Twitter for, um, <laughs> for this for quite a long time. And mainly it's because like, we're not publishers. We don't have any power in the, you know, to say anything. Yeah. All, we, all we try to do is just say like, hey, you guys, like, this makes artists feel bad when you do that. You should know that, you know? You should know, like, like I don't know, at least have the common decency to feel bad about it and realize <laughs> that this person whose work you love, you're really bumming them out by doing this, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that a lot of, almost, not almost every single thing I have to say boils down to the big Lebowski quote of, well, that's just your opinion, man. I'm like, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Just my opinion. Then, I have absolutely no ability, power, authority, anything. All I have is my opinion. And so, right. You know. So, uh, I don't know. It might be weird for me to say this, mm -hmm. but personally, I almost respect people that say, oh, yeah, I'm just going to pirate that. Rather, more so than people that say, oh, it's okay for me to pirate this because this situation this situation like yeah if you're gonna know, pirate right? it just go for it just, just be the bad guy you know excuse. just yep. yeah right don't just come do at it. me with like like death of the author theory yeah. that you don't even know but you googled it on you know once <laughs> on something like that or you know all these other like i guess people come up they they create such an illusion about why they're doing this and then you know to to almost as if it becomes a noble endeavor right um, and it, like at the end of the day it's like just to say I wanted to do it, so I did it. I think that's what most of it boils down to. Right, right. Um, you know, and once again, it's 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 a conscience, con, con, uh, conscience, conscious. I don't know, not conscious either. Uh, I don't know. It's something that people disagree on. Conscience, I wanted to say, but the word lost me. But that's okay too. Um, yes, that'll work. <laughs> but I mean, you know, people have diff different opinions on it, and I think that's fine. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I obviously have no ability to dictate to anyone what they do or don't do. You know, but I will as I try to be um, just to be the advocate for the artist because to me that is the most important person in the equation like every single time I work on a comic I consider my number one customer the person I am most beholden to is the artist you know so if I were yeah. like I, and I take that very seriously so like when I'm doing a, a music you should get to work my job is to to be him to be his advocate you know to to present him in into English in a way that he would be happy with. And if people discover that and enjoy it, I think that that's great, you know? Um, so I, I have a question that we've more or less gone over in different ways. Uh, yeah, sure. But um, are there any other really big misconceptions with a, a translator's role or how things are translated that you see online? For example, um, one that I always go to is people that say, why can't people why can't you just translate it literally when they see something that is a little <laughs> yeah. bit off that yeah still gets the same meaning but they oh i use um, a different idiom in english or something yeah and i mean there, so that's also i mean there's a lot of um dunner kurgan effect that comes in there if mm -hmm. i pronounce that wrong but you know the old theory is like people with a little bit of knowledge think they yeah, have yeah. kind of more knowledge than they actually do um you know if you translate something that is sort of like literally the words on the paper, it will sound terrible. It will not be enjoyable. And it will not once again, spark those same feelings 
that the artist attempted to spark in Japanese. You know, and once again, translation is like everything else. So translation is an art. It is not a science. And that is the reason why we have different people doing it. You know, it's just like different writers or different musicians or whatever it is. Every translator does things differently. So all I can talk about is my own personal process and theory and how I feel about it. And someone else will feel very different. And that's a good thing. You know, like one of my favorite things to do um, is with Jay Rubin, who's the translator of uh, the Murakami, um, Haruki Murakami. Oh, and, um, what Jay a difficult Rubin is, job. Yeah, what well, I mean, Jay Rubin is, you know, he's also, you know, a Harvard professor of Japanese mm -hmm. studies. I mean, he's a, he's, He's a, but he's also just a really nice guy. But Jay and I will have um, what we call translation battles. So we'll get together and I'll pass him a piece and he'll pass me a piece and we'll translate it. And then we do these and we'll throw them up on, you know, because we do these live in front of people. And so we'll throw them up on the screen and sort of compare them. And Jay and I's translation will be different, even though it's both mm -hmm. of us, you know, and neither is wrong. And that I think is also key. And I, that's also something important to know about translation is that Every translator will translate something a little bit different. I think translation is a lot like, I've heard it described multiple ways. One of them is that translation is like playing a piece of music on an oboe that was composed for piano. Um, because you're using an entirely different instrument, an entirely right. different set of sounds. And so what you're really trying, you know, you can do the best you can, you can transpose it and you try to make something like if you try to replicate the piano piece, it won't sound good. So you want it to sound beautiful on the oboe as well, while keeping this, you know, the same general theme of the piece that was on the piano. Mm -hmm. um, another way I've heard translation described is it's like doing a cover song. You know, like if 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 you sing a version of someone's song and I sing a version of someone's song, they will be different. Neither will be the original because it's basically you know, your version of that and my version of that. And translation is the same way. It is an art form. Um, and everyone does it a little differently and everyone will sound a little differently. You know, uh, that's why when you get back into like a lot of translation theories, like, you know, if you go back to, to the Renaissance and things like that, people would often publish new translations of different books and yeah. people were excited to read them because of the new translation, um, because they knew that they were getting almost a new version of the work. And that's, that's how it works. You can never get a pure version of Japanese and English. The languages are far too disparate. Oh, yeah. They are absolutely too disparate. It does not work that way. Um, if you want accuracy, if you really want accuracy, and that matters to you, then learn Japanese. That is it. That is your <laughs> only way. There is no other method of reading something that you really care about, like the supreme accuracy, except for reading it in Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, everything else is going to be different. It's going to be a little bit different. Uh, but if you're trying to do some sort of like awkward, like, you know, if you're too, what I call precious about the word, if you, if you look at the words and you're translating the words um, onto the page, then it is not going to read very well. It's going to be yeah. clumsy and awkward. And once again, a completely different experience from reading in Japanese where it's very smooth and it flows. And so you've lost all of the writer's feeling you know that they've tried to you know all of their emotion you've, you've removed their emotional content and you've just simply rendered it as an exercise in language in word replacement um, and so i always say that when i translate to me the most important thing is to translate the feeling that's my my job is is like the words matter of course they do but what matters more is what were the words attempting to achieve, right? Right. My, my words were attempting to make you laugh here or be scared here, or that's what the author wanted you to do. And so your job is to try and, and a lot of times the way you do that is rephrasing things. Like I just read um, the translator of the Yakuza video game where he was just making this great thread about that, where he's like, if I really translated, you know, every time this guy said, so this guys, is that so, oh, this guy. is that so, is that oh, so? Yeah, he's like, that about, oh yeah. On about the eighth one of those, you would just want to throw the game across the room. And it and wouldn't it, sound cool. Yeah. You know, when it's supposed to sound cool. You know, when he's going, ah, oh, so this guy. And it's like, oh, this guy. Is that so? Is that so? Is that so? You know, right, um, right. that's, but, and that's where I think people get mistaken about translation is they, you know, especially people who don't, or, you know, especially people who know a little Japanese. It's like a lot of people, the people I, who know I think a little what, uh... Japanese, what some people describe it as people that know anime Japanese. They, yeah. They, oh, they yeah. Go, oh, Mamoru. Oh, protect. Chikara. Yeah. 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 Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, and that's another, that's another thing that people don't understand. I think um, 
is that anime Japanese in particular is very affected. Like nobody mm -hmm. actually speaks like that in Japanese, right? A Japanese person does not use those voices. They, any more than a Japanese person sounds like SpongeBob SquarePants. I mean, yeah. those are on purpose fake voices, you know, to sound fake and the phraseology and everything, you know, it's, it's, it's animated, it's, you know, it's over the top. And then you get to Japan and it can be such a weird culture shock to realize like, oh, wow. And you can tell instantly the people that learn from studying anime too, because they, <laughs> they speak Japanese the same way someone would, you know, that studied right. American cartoons. You know, it's like if someone, if a Japanese person comes out to you and starts talking like Rick and Morty, you know, <laughs> that they don't sound normal. You know, they don't sound yeah. like a normal human being having a conversation because it's an affected version of the language. I, I think I studied the right way, which was while I was taking Japanese classes, I found a uh, Japanese dub of The Simpsons and used it oh, as nice. my Rosetta Stone. <laughs> Because nice. I already knew the episodes front to back. The episode front, yeah, no, that's a, that's very good. Um, yeah, there's such a different level of depth, you know. Mm. And um, the better you are as a, as a translator, and the better you are as a Japanese speaker, and the more you know about Japan, the more you are able to move past the surface, right? And a lot of people will see that they're like, oh, you know, like like you know, people were talking about on Twitter the other day. It's like, you know, Onichan and Senpai. Oh, and like, yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, okay, but think about this. What do those words actually mean, right? Because when a Japanese person is saying them, um, and I use this example, it's like, like sensei is a good example, right? Yeah. Um, sensei means a lot of things. It covers a lot of bases in Japanese. Like that one word can translate into like 10 different English words, depending on the context it's worth it. It's in, but if you left it in English as sensei, then it gives a very different emotional beat than it does in Japanese. Like, right. say you have a child who's going to school, and you know, and their mother says, you know, like, "Hey, this is your new sensei," versus "This is your new teacher." Like, both of those have different nuances in English and carry right. different emotional impacts. Well, in English, uh, you would expect somebody, "This is your new sensei." You're introducing a kid to their karate teacher, right? Um, <laughs> But the one, like the one that carries the same emotional resonance in English would be, this is your new teacher. Because right. that's just, you know, and so, um, you know, once again, you're allowing that, that um, sort of like meaning to change the word. For instance, if I was doing a karate uh, face, then I would leave it as sensei, you know, because yeah. that carries the same sort of emotional resonance. And I think that also matters a lot when you're talking about translation. It's like, you also, have, you have to let the work dictate the style, you know, and everything should be approached on a case by case basis. You know, there's mm -hmm. some works where, for example, leaving honorifics is absolutely the right choice. It's what this work demands. It's important. It's necessary. But then I was reading Mace on a Koku, for example, and they don't include yeah. the honorifics, but they do include, they do keep the word Ronin in Japanese. And it's totally appropriate. Like those were great choices, you know, um, because, and they didn't just do a blanket thing, you know, they're like, oh, well, I, I know what senpai is, so I want to always read that. Um, right, even right. though a lot, you know, and I had that conversation with people about the word nakama in, uh, in One Piece. It's like, <laughs> I know what nakama means. You're like, what does it mean? And they'll describe it to you as like some sort of bond of friendship. You know, it goes blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, that's absolutely not what nakama means. Nakama right. is a very shallow word. Um, but in One Piece, they take this common ordinary word and they infuse it with extra meaning, right? So if you actually make that word special, it's different from the intent of the author, which was to say like, you know, to take an ordinary word and make it special. Um, yeah, that went rambling too, but a lot of thoughts No, no, <laughs> uh, actually I was going to bring up the honorifics because yeah. I know that that is a, not just a debate that you mm -hmm. got brought into, but uh, it is totally. a debate yeah. that has existed since the existence of both English and Japanese and people bring one work into right. another. And, and it's, a, it's, it's one of those things where it's an opinion that I have changed my mind about um, yeah. because there was a time pre-Japan when I was like, oh, I want the honorifics. And I realized I wanted the honorifics because it made me feel special. It made me feel like I had this <laughs> secret knowledge that I knew Japan, right? That I knew right. it, you know, that I could lecture people about it, that I could get on there and and like it was like it was but it was about me feeling special that i knew these words that's why i wanted them you know like oh of course oh you don't know what chan means oh well, let me tell you, oh, you yeah. know, or san or blah 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 and then when i got in japan and actually got to be fluent in japanese i realized that almost everything i had thought about the honorifics was completely and utterly wrong you know, completely yeah. um, and so i started to realize that 
that leaving them in English was bizarre because when you speak English, you don't use them, you know? Um, right. If I'm speaking English with, to a Japanese person, I'm not going to use, I mean, there are some times I might, it really depends on the, once again, on the level, but for the most part, you don't. It sounds weird using the, and it sounds very affected, and it's attempting to layer in new meaning that's not there in the original. And that's right. one of the reasons why I don't personally, I mean, but once again, there are always exceptions, and there are absolutely always books where the, keeping the honorifics is the better call. But I think in general, um, you're then, you're, you're layering in this sort of like special meaning. And you're also, you're trying to make this work be foreign, you know, and like by putting this in, you're like, this is a foreign book. Whereas when you actually read it in Japan, none of that is in there. There's none of this right. like, oh, I'm reading this foreign thing, you know. Um, it's um, kind of like uh, I have here on my shelf. Oh, wait, I'm hiding all of it. I have Usagi Yojimbo. Oh, I love Usagi Yojimbo. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I, it's one I of also my have all of Usagi Yojimbo on my shelf. So. Fantastic. Uh, and growing up, because I grew up reading Usagi, I, that taught me so much. I don't know, just like little things because um, uh, Stan Sake would like leave in little footnotes and afterwards and oh, yeah. stuff like that. But like you said, that is a that is a work that is deliberately trying to be foreign. It is not a totally. Japanese manga. It is an American comic yeah. about Japan. And that's the difference is that is Stan's intent, right? Yeah. Um, Stan wants that to be an educational tool, right? So by preserving that, you are preserving Stan's intent. And that is a perfect example. He mm -hmm. did that himself. He put those in there because he wanted to teach you. Um, whereas Rumiko Takashi did not. She did not write right. Mason Akoku as a way of, you know, as a, as a textbook to teach people about Japanese culture, right? That is not her intent. She wrote a slapstick comedy <laughs> that she wanted you to laugh at. Um, right. And so anything that you're doing with Mason Akoku that does not involve you laughing or, you know, cringing or whatever those emotional things are, um, then that's not what she wrote it for, you know? But Stan Sky, on the other hand, absolutely. And same with like Mizuki Shigeru, like Showa History of Japan. He wrote that as an instructional tool, you know, that, and so he put in his own notes and things like that. And so, so that is appropriate for that work, um, right. but it's less appropriate for a work like Kitaro, which, you know, I could easily do an annotated version. I could do an annotated version of Kitaro that broke down all these folklore things and included all, and people might find it interesting, but it would not be what he wanted. You know, mm -hmm. it would not be what he wanted when he made the comic. He didn't want you to study this. He wanted you to enjoy it, you know? Um, and I think that's, you know, I think that's fine. Like, like if you like annotate, I love annotated editions. Oh yeah, yeah. I think they're great. You know, they're so interesting, but I think that, that that reading an annotated version is a different experience than reading a non-annotated version. Right. You know, it is the, the uh, you read it. director's commentary that you watch after you've watched the movie the first time. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's why I've often said, like, I like writing in additional stuff, but I always think that it needs to live, like the work needs to live on its own. And then if you put that in the back and people can enjoy it if they want, they can go the extra level. I right. think that's really nice, you know, but I don't think that, I don't like comics where you're reading them and there's like, you know, see note five, you know, see this note. And so you have to flip back and blah, blah, blah. Because now you've you stopped like the crucial flow and the reading flow is something that uh, is so important to an uh, artist when they're creating. It's like trying to right. pace their story and everything. Are you talking about manga or are you talking about Marvel and DC comics where every other page, <laughs> is, hey, see this for this. Oh see my this God. One. All uh, of them. Yes. <laughs> but once again, they intend that. They right. put that in there. And so if they put I that mean, in there, then that is their intent, right? Yeah. Unless uh, unless it's the uh, Marvel editorial intent, intent uh, you know, then you get yeah. a whole different debate, a whole different That's a whole different debate. Discussion. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, but actually, I have asked everything that was on my uh, handy. On your list? Off. Okay. Do you have any closing words or things that you want to plug? for my YouTube channel. I'm sure you have a much bigger audience than, than me. So. Oh, no, no. I mean, this like, I love, I mean, I just love coming on and talking about this. It's really fascinating. You're like, mm -hmm. me and my other, um, we were just talking about this with a few of my other um, translator friends. It's like, we actually like talking about this stuff, but it so much ends up in a shouting fight with people that it's, oh, you know, um, that the opera, you know, cause like, that's one of my favorite things too. Like I miss comic book conventions because I would go to anime conventions and lead like translator round tables where we all have these discussions. And so I think it's great. I think it's great if people are interested in, um, in localization and translation and want to learn more about it. 
but um, I think it's it's dangerous when they come to it thinking that they know the answers. Um, and somehow people that have been doing it for 10, 15, 20 years somehow are less knowledgeable than they are about mm -hmm. it, which I think causes a lot of the battles that you see, um, which is a little unfortunate. But but also, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, people are allowed to have their opinions. You know, they're allowed to think what they think and do what they want, just like I am. And that's one of the wonderful things about the world, I suppose. Oh, yeah. Great thing yeah. about the internet. Exactly. All right. So, yeah, thanks, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate oh, yeah. it.